so we were together in Hawassa in, in Ethiopia. We had a bunch of people from a bunch of countries. We've got some people with a lot of experience. We've got trainees with a lot of experience. We're pretty well positioned for a good week talking about conservation implementation. And I kind of want to begin this introduction to the course by emphasizing that, okay? This course is about the implementation phase, and that takes a lot of us out of our comfort zones, okay? Definitely me, which is to say I'm planning to give a couple of talks and then sit down and shut up, okay? Where I do, where I can offer more to this process is in the planning phase in the strategy, in the prioritization. Um, and we'll talk some about that side of the, of the uh, issue. We'll talk some about um, how do you pick ideal areas. But really the emphasis of this course is on once we've picked those areas, what are the considerations and what are the next steps, okay? Um, and there are parts of this that we're not going to talk about. For example, we're not going to talk about all of the political dimensions because that's going to end up being very country specific. Okay? The challenges in Cameroon will be different from the challenges in Uganda, uh, which will be different from the challenges in Ethiopia. Um, so what we're going to try to do is stay kind of at the basic concepts of for conservation Im implementation, what are the important challenges, what are the important considerations. And then if you go back to your country and are in the position of, of uh, implementing a conservation area of whatever sort, then it's up to you to take those general le lessons and translate them into the context of the local people who live around the area, the local government, the national government, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? So, let's start with setting a bit of the scene for kind of conservation. And I'm gonna kind of go at this from top down, from global to local. Um, and I'm not going to get terribly local because the local will end up being the focus of a lot of this course. But we have a lot of um, uh, schemes and prioritizations of this sort. This is the biodiversity hotspots. You can see it's from Conservation International, which is actually where, where Lee works. Um, and what you can see is that they have uh, identified a series of hotspots around the world. And these are, correct me if I'm wrong, Lee, they're intended to be places that have high diversity combined with high threat, correct? And uh, endemism, thank you. And so you can see kind of all of the usual characters. Um, there's Liberia for Benedictus, parts of Ethiopia, Southeast Asia, North Africa, Madagascar, South Africa, right? All the usual suspects. Um, there's some interesting things in here. Like notice the Amazon is, is omitted. And that's somewhere in this, in this formula of um, a mixture of endemism and threat. Um, similarly, the Congo. Um, so we could spend the whole week talking about how you do this. How do you get to these prioritizations? It's some set of balancing of how big are species ranges and how much has habitat been degraded in recent decades. We're not gonna spend this week talking about that step, okay? We're gonna spend this week talking about, okay, within this area or this area, what comes next? And so there's a whole literature. This kind of falls into the trap that Mona painted. Uh, this is all about conservation biology, okay? It doesn't really get to conservation science. But there's a whole big set of journals and books and now textbooks and thinking about what's the science behind conservation. 
And so we see lots and lots of these, these global studies. Um, this one looks like it's out of Conservation International, Global Biodiversity Conservation Priorities. In fact, that's probably what generated the hotspot maps. Um, we have very robust tools for doing these prioritization steps. Um, here by Margulis and Pressey, systematic conservation planning. Uh, here's a very interesting paper looking at conservation conflicts across Africa. And so um, there's increasing evidence that areas of outstanding conservation importance may coincide with dense human settlement or impact. So essentially the places that, this is obviously on a slightly more local scale than the global, but it's still very coarse with respect to the local, but it's saying that precisely the places where you would most want to put a place to conserve biodiversity are the places where it will be hardest to do that based on human um, interests and needs and, and activities. Um, so, I'm just giving you kind of a smattering of examples, but you'll notice I'm going, going kind of global down to local. Um, and you can see here they're overlaying number of species. These are microendemic species in, in northeastern Brazil um, against protected areas, which you can see in green. And you know, they're pointing out things. And in fact, the last time I saw Lee, we were right about there. Um, but you can see there's this hyperendemic area, and you see almost no green shapes in there. So um, again, we're kind of coming down finer and finer. Um, this is a, a very local thing that I did years and years ago, and I included it here only because we brought into the formula uh, an element of land tenure. So it wasn't just where's the, bi the bio biodiversity, but it was also who owns the land, which is going to make a big difference as far as what can you do and what can you not do. And so then we get down to things like this, aligning conservation priorities across taxa in Madagascar with high resolution planning tools. So here they go from the, the very coarse, you know, where are the species? down to the finer elements of um, what's actually happening at these sites. But this is still at the level of a country, okay? Now in the case of Madagascar, it's been pretty exciting because you see news items such as this. Madagascar creates millions of acres of new protected areas. And Madagascar's protected area surface tripled Okay, so these things can translate into real action, but these are actually unusual cases. There are a lot of countries where you can't say that the science moved through the politics and all of this phase of implementation to the point where you get not only decreed protected areas, but also successful, effective decreed protected areas. And then we can go all the way down to the local, uh, designing a particular national park in Madagascar based on both biological and socioeconomic data. So um, I think what we're really after, I think where there, we won't have any debate, is that we're really after preserving landscapes and everything that goes into them, the biodiversity, the functioning ecosystem, the ecosystem services, the actual species that make up the ecosystem, okay? And those landscapes, we want perhaps the bulk of them to be very natural, but we're gonna hear a lot of um, variations on the theme of where are the humans in these pictures, okay? Is there a settlement right over here? Or is this a, a more exclusive conservation area? So 
just to give kind of a very broad outline, how, do, how are we trying to do this translation of science into effective conservation? Certainly the goal is to conserve functioning natural systems and all of their components well into the future. Um, I would always include the caveat that all of the elements, and especially the irreplaceable elements, have to be included. Which is to say, and we talked about this a bit on Thursday, as we talk about biodiversity and ecosystem services, sometimes the ecosystem services don't care about which species is doing the service. And so it's a, it's a complex argument to use the ecosystem services to justify the conservation because you may be losing these irreplaceable elements. We can't go back and rescue a species from extinction once it's gone. And then we also need to bring in the human dimension or all of this will amount to what's been called a paper park. It's not simply a matter of avoiding conflicts, it's a matter of finding, finding synergies and efficiencies. Uh, it may actually make, make the conservation implementation challenge more feasible economically, okay, to bring in this human dimension. But it has to be done intelligently and, and with a lot of, of forethought. So that's, that's a non-conservation biologist view of this field. Sorry, I used the term conservation biology, Mona. Um, which is to say, this is a view from outside, um, but I hope it'll be kind of a starting point for a lot of good com conversations in the next week. So what are we going to try to do in this course? We've got experts and students together in this room, and hopefully we'll have rich discussions. Hopefully there'll be a lot of questions and a lot of interaction. We will be both in the classroom and in uh, protected areas across this part of Ethiopia to try to get kind of a diverse set of experiences. Um, hopefully we'll have rich discussions about what works and what doesn't work. Um, again, informal discussions are very much encouraged. We don't have to all go our separate ways when we leave this room, okay? Continue the conversations, continue the debates, as much as all of our energy permits. And of course, we're capturing all of this so that people beyond the 20 some people in this room can also benefit from this course. So here are your instructors. Um, you've already met them, so I really won't, won't go into detail, but Mona, Bilal, Lee, Fikirte, and Kate, and me. That's the older granddaughter, uh, and that's Kate in the uh, Korup National Park in, in um, Cameroon. And we were both laughing and laughing that we're in the midst of this lowland rainforest, which was quite beautiful. And it says, nature trail that way. We were kind of in the middle of it right there. Anyhow, um, your instructors bring a lot of experience to these questions. So do you, the trainees. Um, but take good advantage of this course. Um, talk with people, debate with people.